standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. remain standing for the reading from God's Word. Romans 11, 28 through 32, and 12, 1 through 2, says this. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient, that though through mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, O Spirit, come make us humble. Turn our eyes from evil things. O oh Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God and Jacob. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God and Jacob. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. O Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. O Lord, we cast out our idols. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob, oh God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob, that seeks your face. Oh God of Jacob, we seek your face. Oh God of Jacob. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether loving, 
Amen. Thank you, sweetheart. There's my sweetheart, y'all. <laughs> Amen. Hey, Jewel, we're going to do this again this week. I want you to do a pan of the audience. Y'all going to do thumbs up. Those of you who are out there watching, if they hold their thumb up, that means they're smiling back at you. Everybody hold your thumb up. There we go. Yeah, I want everybody to see the group that we have and see how we're distance and how we're sitting everybody is safe got their mask on except me and uh, but uh, just want uh, those of you who are out there watching to know that it is safe to be here for some of you that may not be true I understand that so uh, you continue to pray about when God would have you to come and uh, and regather with us as a church so do have a good crowd this morning I praise the Lord for that hey if you have your Bibles go ahead and look with me to the book of Colossians chapter 3 Colossians chapter 3. We'll be looking there this morning as we continue our series out of the book of Colossians. As we start, I just want to ask you a question. Who are you? Who are you? This is just rhetorical. You don't have to shout it out. But who are you? Are you? Do you know who you really are? Who are you? You know, I am Alan Crosby, and I'm married to Marsha Crosby, and uh, we have a wonderful relationship and a wonderful marriage. And I know who I am. Um, I'm also the pastor of First Baptist Church of Jewett. And I know that God's called me to, to pastor, and I know that He's called me to be here and I'm also a father I'm the father of Amanda Michael and Melissa and uh, they're in different places but I'm still their dad I'm a grandpa as as well and as I mention these things as I speak these things for many of you um, you can think of who you are in in that area you know some of you I know your grandma's here grandpa's here and all of that. But you know, there's something else that we must add to that. And it's really priority, and it really should be number one. And that is that I am a child of God. I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And for every person who's sitting here today who has repented of their sin and who has asked Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior, you are a child of the King. You are a child of the creator of all that exists. And, and that's exciting to know. If you know Christ, then you know Him and you belong to Him. We must always remember who we are and remember that first of all, we are a child of God. You know, it, it, it's never ceased to amaze me in talking to different ones and even those who claim to be Christians who try to separate who they are on Sunday from who they are the rest of the week. I mean, in the way that they do their jobs, the way that they relate to family members or to friends or to all of those things. Well, I believe 
that it's impossible for the believer. We could, we could do that, but, but it's not what we should do. We must remember, first of all, who we are. We are a child of God. And because we are a child of God, because we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it governs everything else that we do. It will impact your marriage. It will impact your relationship with your children. It impacts your job. It impacts everything that you do. And it is wrong and it is sinful when we try to separate those things. We are who we are in Christ. If we are truly a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot separate who we are from how we interact from day to day in life. It should govern everything about us. That's important for us to realize and to remember. The Apostle Paul wrote in chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, that there were some characteristics and there were some things that you and I needed to get rid of. He says we need to take these things off like clothing. And he gives us a list of sin that, that once was as he points it out to the Colossian church, he said, these things were in your past. These were things that you practiced and you did regularly in your past, but not so now. And he lists them. He says, fornication, that's sex outside of marriage, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, anger, wrath, foul language. He, he, he said, all of these, we're to take them off as if we're taking off a garment. They should not be a part of the Christian life. But in this next section of chapter 3, Paul deals not with the negatives, but he deals with a positive aspect, and that is who we are. In just as we're to put off sin in our life, just as we're to put off characteristics that are ungodly, that do not bring honor to God, as we're to put those off, there are some things that we're to put on. And that's what we're going to deal with today. So he gives us a, la a list of things that we're to put on. Things to clothe ourselves with. Isn't it amazing at how much time we spend on our clothing? I mean, uh, you know, we, I mean, we got shops, we got dress shops, we've got western wear, we've got, you, you name it. You know, you can go, if it, whatever your personality is and your likes, you can go out and find a store that caters to you, and we'll spend a lot of time to, to match up, you know, to make sure everything is, is coordinated just right, and, and we get up on Sunday morning, and we got to make sure all that stuff's right. You know, and, and here in the last three weeks, I would say that we get all dressed up with nowhere to go. <laughs> I mean, most of you just decided you weren't going to get dressed up, so you just stay at home in your PJs. I, I, know, I know that <laughs> that has happened. For, for many of us on, on many days. But this morning, I want to talk to you about getting all dressed up with somewhere to go, okay? And, 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 and we have to think about that spiritually speaking. Do we take time to examine how we're doing? Do we take time to look at areas in our life that we need to improve? In other words, are there some areas that we need, are there some characteristics that we need to put on as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? I believe that there are certain characteristics, certain attitudes, certain traits that should absolutely be a part of every believer in Christ, every believer's life. These traits ought to be present. And Paul talks about these traits, these attitudes, these characteristics. Chuck Swindoll said, I am convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. And so it is with you. We're in charge of our attitudes. And we can change if we, in the power of the Holy Spirit, with God living in us, if we make up our mind with His help that we're going to change. And I think that there's probably areas in our life that we all need to change and we need to work at work on today we're going to look at colossians chapter 3 we're going to begin reading in verse 12 and in honor of reading god's word i want to ask that you stand with me if you're able and we will read colossians chapter 3 beginning with verse 12 the word of god says therefore as elect of god holy and beloved put on 
put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I pray that in the power of your Holy Spirit that you'd speak to us through your word today. God, I know you have a message for us. God, show us areas of our lives that, Lord, we need to put off. But Lord, today, show us areas that we need to put on. Show us the characteristics that should be a part of our life. Some areas maybe we need to work on or to strengthen. And Lord, we'll praise you for all that you do. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. If we are to have a right attitude for living, it is important that we remember who we are. Yes, I believe, as the Apostle Paul says, that we're to put on the whole armor of God. We need to do that every day. And we need to remind ourselves before we get out of the bed who we are are in Christ and we need to make up our mind and we need to pray in that moment that from that moment on throughout the rest of the day whatever might come our way and it will come that we will remember who we are in Christ and we res will respond accordingly first of all this morning I want you to note as we begin that believers in Christ are loved by God in verse 1 in our text, it says, I'm sorry, not verse 1, but in verse 12, it says, Therefore, as elect of God, therefore, as elect of God, be and, and beloved, put on tender mercies, and he gives a list there that we're going to talk about. But I want you to know that you are loved by God. You know how I know that you're loved by God if you're a believer in Christ? You know how I know that I'm a loved by God? Because I'm the elect of God. I'm identified as the elect of God. That's the first thing that Paul mentions there in verse 12. He says, therefore, as elect of God, to believers in Christ, he's writing. Paul writing to these Christians, and the first word that he uses describes Christians as elect of God. Elect means picked out, chosen, handpicked by God. You see, you did not choose God. God chose you. And you say, Pastor, how do you know that? How can you, how can you back that up? The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, 9, but God demonstrates His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible likens the lost person as to one who is evil, one who is blind, one who is dead, maybe walking, maybe breathing, but dead spiritually. And then the Holy Spirit of God came into our lives and God revealed to us our lostness. And if He had not done that, you would not be saved today. He revealed to you your lostness. And in that same power, He gave us faith to even believe that He could forgive us. So it's all about Him. We're always on the receiving end when it comes to God. You are, Paul says, the elect of God. Someone else put it this way. His choice, that is God's choice, His choice was that all who accept Christ are among the chosen God set us apart. You're the elect of God. The word, that, that meaning, elect of God, that chosen one means that we have been set apart, which leads to the next thing that Paul talks about being holy because we've trusted Christ we've been we've been set apart from the world unto the Lord we are not our own we belong completely to him and we need to remember that who are you you are the elect of God and then Paul says here in verse 12 you're not only the elect of God but you are holy that's who you are so you're not just the elect of God but you are holy 
Holy means to be separated from sin. It means to be separated from the world. You are separated unto God. Separated from sin for God in, in who is holy. The Bible says, Be ye holy for I am the Lord. God is holy. And He, listen church, He expects nothing else from us. We are to be holy. So, when you wake up on Monday morning, you need to remind yourself, I'm a child of God. I'm the elect of God. I'm holy. And you see, what, you see where I'm going with this? It's going to govern everything you do, every thought, every action, everything that you do because you remember you're the elect of God. You are holy before God. God is holy and He expects nothing less from us because we belong to Him and we're His children. Warren Wiersbe said this, we are not our own. We belong completely to Him. And then he likens it unto a marriage. He says, just as the marriage ceremony sets apart a man and a woman for each other exclusively, so salvation sets the believer apart exclusively for Jesus Christ. He goes on, he says, would it not be a terrible thing at the end of the wedding to see the groom run off with the maid of honor? It's the same thing. When we are the elect of God and we are holy and we forget who we belong to and then we go out in the world and we begin to act like the world. It's, it's not any different. The Bible likens the church, the Bible likens you to the bride of Christ. So when we, when we run away, we, we go back in the Old Testament even and look at Israel and God refers to them many times as harlots. Because they continually ran away from God and got out of the will of God and began to worship idols and began to get away from God. And, and folks, we are the elect of God. We are holy. That is not to be the case in our lives. We're separated for God's service. But then, we're not only elect, we're not only holy, but we are beloved of God. We're the elect, we're holy, and we're beloved. We are beloved because we are elect and a holy people. Listen, not everybody is the elect, holy, and beloved. This is an exclusive group. It really is. This is for the one who is born again. This is for the person who has accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. It does, it's not for everybody. It is for only those who put their faith and their trust in Christ who can say that they're the elect, that they're holy, and that they're beloved of God. Oh, I tell you, church, we need to constantly remind ourselves of who we are because there's a lot of voices out there. There's a lot of messages out there in the world that are telling us that we're something other than that. But that's who we are. We're the elect of God. We're holy. We belong to Him. We're His beloved. And this is only possible through a relationship with Christ. Romans 1, 7 it says, Among whom are you also the call of Jesus Christ. I'm convinced that many people know about Christ this morning. But there are not many that know Him. That have a personal relationship with Him. Well, there's a lot of people that know about Him. And they have their opinions. And there are a lot of people that even may even try to model their lives after Him and, and think that He lived a good life and so should they. And maybe they can model their activity and lives after Him. But I'm not talking about, I'm talking about receiving Christ yourself. We may, you may recall the story of Nicodemus over in the book of John. And the Bible says, Jesus said to him, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is what I'm talking about here this morning. Those who are born again, they are the elect. They are holy. They are the beloved of God. This is who we're talking about. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a religious leader of the day, probably prominent, probably wealthy, probably had a lot of prestige, and people looked up to who he was, and Jesus said to him, you 
must be born again. He was bewildered by it. He thought, "You, what do you mean by this? I've, I've done, man, I've been living by the commandments. I've been doing everything right. But Jesus looked at him and said, you must be born again. I want you to know something. The beloved, the elect, those who are holy, they have been born again. They are, they are in an exclusive group. For those of you who are born again, Paul, Paul wrote, you are the elect of God, you are holy, and you are beloved. I ask the question again before we get into the next point. Who are you? Do you really know who you are? You can't live the life that God wants you to live. You can't live a life that's full and meaningful in the here and now until you settle that fact, until you know who you are. We need to remember who we are. And then secondly, believers in Christ are to clothe themselves with godly traits. The first two traits describe how we're to treat others. Paul says, tender mercies. Put on tender mercies. Therefore, as elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, in other words, put that garment on, put on the tender mercies of God. King James says, bowels of mercy. That doesn't sound good to me, bowels. Something about that. But I like the, the term tender mercies. Put on tender mercies. Let me ask you something. Do you have a compassionate heart? Are you compassionate? When you see people who are hurting, who are down, do you immediately rush to judgment? Or are you compassionate? Does your heart go out to them without judgment? And then he says kindness. Kindness is tied closely to having a compassionate heart. If I were to ask the people that you know best, who you work with, who you live with, who you're around from day to day, hey, is so-and-so, would you consider, would you classify them as being a kind person? What would they say? You know, oftentimes we view ourselves differently than other people view us. And you know, I, I'm not all that worried about that, but I think that if other people see me as being a person that's not kind, I need to think about that. I need to look at that. Because the Bible says that we're to put on tender mercies, and for the believer that we're to put on kindness, that we're to be kind. And, and that's, that's part of the clothing for those of us who are Christ. The next two traits describe our state of mind. He says here in verse 12 again, put on tender mercies, kindness. What is the term he uses? Humility. We're to be of a humble spirit. is hum, Humility is having a humble opinion of oneself. And then he says meekness. Now meekness we know, and we've talked about this before, it's not weakness, but it has to do with being gentle and meek. Frank Page says, it is power under control. Power under control. He went on to write this. He said, this word, was used to describe soothing wind, a healing medicine, and a cult that had been broken. In each instance, there is power. A wind can become a storm. Too much medicine can kill you. And a horse can break loose if he so chooses to do so. But this power is under control. Believer in Christ, who are you? I want you to know something today. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God filled you with His Spirit, with the power of Almighty God. You are a powerful person because He lives in you. But we understand that we're to have a spirit of meekness and humility. We don't want that necessarily we we understand who we are in christ and we keep that in check the reality is is i'm a saved sinner by the grace of god and one day i'm going home to be with heaven and i know that to be an absolute fact why because i know christ and there is no power in this world that's going to keep that from happening there's a power of god god has a power to save me but he also has a power to keep me and I know that and understand that we need to know that. The last three traits relate to how we should act when we're mistreated. He uses the term long-suffering. has to do with 
being slow about avenging wrongs. Anybody struggle there? I mean, you know, when somebody does me wrong, I want you to know something. I'm not the same. When I was be before Christ, I was a fighter. I mean, if you back me into the corner, I was going to fight you. But, but as a believer in Christ, as we mature in Christ, that should not be our first reaction. We should be long-suffering. And Paul says we need to put this on, we're to clothe ourselves with long-suffering, bearing with one another to endure mistreatment, forgiving one another. Why? Why would we do that? Because in the last part of verse 13, he tells us, he says, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. Forgive one another. Someone offended you lately? You've been hurt by someone in your family perhaps, or friend? Have you forgiven them? Have you forgiven them? Have you made up your mind already that you'll go to your grave before that ever happens? It's sad to say that happens all too often. How many friendships could have been salvaged if we would have just said, I'm sorry. How many marriages could have been salvaged if we would have just said, I am sorry. How many churches could have avoided splits and problems if we would have just said, I am sorry. But pastor, I didn't do anything wrong. Neither did Jesus. He was spit on. He was cursed at. He was mocked. They literally pulled the hair out of his face from his beard. They beat him. They hung him on the cross, nailed him to the cross. And right before he drew his last breath, he looked out across that crowd and he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Well, the Apostle Paul says we're to clothe ourselves with these characteristics, with these traits. We ought to have a forgiving spirit. We need to be long suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. The last in this list, and I believe it's the most important, Paul said what? Verse 14, and above all these, put on love. Say that with me. Love. One more time. Love. Put on love. You want to see love? Go to the cross. For God so loved the world. For God so loved everybody in this auditorium. For God so loved everybody who's watching us this morning that He went to the cross to die for sins He didn't commit. He went to the cross to die for my stinkingness, my rottenness. He died for me. Why? Because He loves me. And He loves you. And if you put your faith and your trust in Him, then you are in Christ you are beloved of God. You are holy. You are the elect of God. He loves you. And when we go out from day to day in our life, we need to remind ourselves, I represent Him. And I need to love people just the way He did. I need to show forth the love of God. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. Listen, Jesus Christ went to the cross. There was no ulterior motives there. He could have just ended it all. But no, He went to the cross. The only reason I can figure out that He went to the cross is because He loved me. And guess what? He loves you too. The Bible says He loves you with an everlasting love. 
Listen, you may be sitting here today and you think nobody in the world loves you. I want you to know something. God loves you. He really, really does. He loves you more than you could ever dream, ever you, more than you could ever hope for. And the Apostle Paul says that we need to put on love as believers. And then last of all, believers in Christ are to be thankful. According to 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Bible says, be, there, be thankful in all circumstances. All circumstances. Let's say that one more time. Be thankful in all circumstances. That's not always easy to do, is it? According to James 1 2, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Count it all, all joy when you fall into various trials. It's not always to be thankful, and I understand this. Listen, when things are not going well at work, when you get to notice that you've been laid off for no apparent reason, when your health is declining, when, when things are not going well, it can get tough to be thankful. I can remember at least two times in my life where I was without work, I was out without employment, was out without an income. And I just want to be just transparent with you. I wasn't the best Christian during those times. I mean, God had to convict me. I learned some things through those experiences. God taught me some very valuable lessons during those experiences. But the Apostle Paul says we're to be thankful in all of that. Why? Because, folks, this is not it. We're just passing through this world. There's going to be tough times. There's going to be rough days that come. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you it's all pie in the sky when you come to Christ. I think most of you know that's not true. But I guarantee you one thing. I have a promise from God. One day I'm going home to be with Him. And everything that God desires is going to take place. It's going to happen because I'm going to a perfect place. I'm going to a place where there is no more sin, where there is no more trials, where there is no more troubles. So I can be joyful in the here and now, even when it becomes very difficult. It's not always easy to be thankful when you've lost person that's closest to you we can be thankful that we have eternal life we can be thankful about who we are in Christ Jesus and then Paul says we're to let the peace of God rule in our hearts he says in verse 15 and let the peace of God rule in your hearts when we let the peace of God rule in our hearts we can be thankful in the most difficult times why because God is on the throne of our lives and we know that He's in control. More than that, He's promised that He is with me. In His Word, He said, He will never leave me nor forsake me. And I have that promise and I have that confidence here this morning. Paul says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you. He says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts and then let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in verse 15. Through reading the Word and we, we even go over to the Psalms where we, we read about the psalmist and some of the songs that are written there. It's, it's, it's amazing as we, we can almost feel the experiences that they experience as we read those. But he says, through singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Listen, folks, you sing, Kevin sings, Cynthia sings, Marcia sings. We all sing not because we have some great ability to sing. We sing because we have a song to sing. You see, that comes from the overflow of our life as we experience God in His richness and then we're able to sing praises to Him. If the only reason that we sing is because we like to hear ourselves, there's a problem with that. <laughs> no, we sing because we have a song to sing. And I think I said this in relation to another something else last week. But listen, church, if you don't sing right now and you may think you can't sing and hold a tune anywhere, start practicing. Because one day we're going to get to heaven and you know what? Every one of you are going to sing. Everybody in this auditorium will sing one day. So you may as well go ahead and get used to it. As I go over and I read Revelation and we find as they gathered around the throne of God, they cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Listen, we're going to be singing for all eternity. <coughs> when we go home to be with the Lord. 
So sing, not because you can, but because you have a song to sing. If God has spoken to your heart and from the overflow, you sing praises to His name. The Word of God dwell. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. Paul then says we're to do everything. How? As unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. You're dealing with people every day. As you deal with those individuals, do it as unto the Lord. Would I say what I'm about to say to Him? Would it please Him? Listen, do everything you do as unto the Lord. Most of you have had or have jobs where you don't own the business. But you know what? We're to work as unto the Lord. If you own your own business, I hate to tell you this, you really don't. It belongs to God. So even if you own your own business, the way you treat your employees, the way you run that business, as should be as unto the Lord. Remember what we said in the beginning? Don't forget who you are. You can't separate who you are from what you do. So we're to do everything that we do as unto the Lord as we clothe ourselves with tender mercies, as we clothe ourselves with humility, as we do all these things, we're to do it as unto the Lord. If you're not doing what you're doing for Him, you don't need to quit doing it. You just need to repent because it is sin. Everything we do, should do, as unto the Lord. In closing, remember who you are in Christ. You're God's elect. You're holy. You're His beloved. Paul says, be tender, kind, humble, long-suffering, forgiving, and then don't forget, put on the garment of love. Let love govern all that you do. And in all that you do, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, do it as unto the Lord. Next week, we're going to talk about the Christian family as we continue on in the book of Colossians, chapter 3. I hope that you can be here. And I hope those who are watching can come and be with us in person as we regather. I want you, if you would, for just a moment to bow your heads. And every head's bowed, every eye's closed. As you are praying. Maybe there's an area in your life, one that you need to get rid of. Maybe an area that you need to Maybe you need to take that off or get that out of your life, but perhaps there's an area that you need to clothe yourself with as you remember who you are in Christ. Listen, God loves you. He knows what's best for you. and He wants the very best for you. I pray that you would just do a little introspection right now. As God speaks to your heart, just talk to Him about what He's speaking to you about today. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. Well, I hope today's service has been a blessing to you. And again, we want to pray for you. We want to hear from you. So please contact us if we can help you in any way. Perhaps today, uh, for the first time during the course of this service, you realize 
that you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe for the first time you realize that you're not a part of the family of God. Well, the good news of the gospel is, is that right where you are, you can put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means you, that means me. And the Bible also says that the wages of those sins is death. But then it goes on, it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, Jesus made full payment for your sins and mine on the cross over 2,000 years ago. And then after three days, he, he, after three days of being in the grave, he rose from the dead and he's a, alive today. But uh, maybe wherever you might be right now, you would want to pray and ask Christ to come into your life and to be your Lord and be your Savior. Would you bow your heads with me just for a moment? And as you bow your heads, would you just maybe just repeat the words that, that I say? Maybe you don't know how to, to do this or how to accept Christ. Well, God knows your heart and he knows what's going on in your life and, uh, and he will answer your prayer. So would you pray a prayer something like this with me today and trust Christ as your Lord and as your Savior? Dear God, I know that I have sinned against you. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, that you rose again on the third day. Lord, forgive me of all my sin. Come into my heart and life and be my Lord and Savior. Now, Lord, help me to live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer today for the first time, I want to be the first to welcome you to the family of God. And I'd like to go a step further as well. I'd like for you to contact me and let me know that you prayed that prayer. have some information I'd like to share with you about your next steps in your walk with Christ. And we would love to pray for you. So use that email, prayer at fbcjewett.org or just simply give us a call here at First Baptist Church of Jewett. God bless you. I hope that you'll join us again next week at 11 o'clock as we continue our study in the book of Colossians.